Amen. You know, the Holy Spirit is in this place. And, uh, you know, as we, as we celebrate and we sing praises to him, I mean, the weight of the Holy Spirit, even now, um, I, I don't even know if I can stand up here. But this morning, I want to encourage you in something. This morning, I want to encourage you uh, in sharing with the lost and moving in faith toward Jesus Christ. And for those of you who are witnesses of Jesus Christ, I want to challenge you to deepen your testimony in sharing the faith with those who are lost. You know, since life is short and uncertain, and eternity is forever. The most important question anyone could ask is how can I be saved? How can I know for certain that I am right with God? And sadly, even among Christians, there are different answers to that question. I mean, some folks think that if a person is just sincere in what they believe, that it really doesn't matter what you believe, but I wanna tell you this morning that you can be sincerely wrong. And what I mean by that is it absolutely matters what you believe. It absolutely matters what you believe about Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. You know, another common belief is that to be saved, we have to be good people. I thought this was funny. C.S. Lewis, he used to say this. He said, you cannot go on being a good egg forever. You have to either hatch or rot. You cannot go on being a good egg forever. Listen, good people, good people need Jesus. Even good people need Jesus. And the thinking kind of goes along this line. If we try to do our best, if we don't hurt anyone, if we help others, then we will get to heaven. And often faith in Christ is combined with with being good and with good works. And so if we do the best we can and we add a little bit of Jesus to that, then we're good to go. We're good. That's going to get us into heaven. But the Bible teaches very clearly that we are saved by God's grace, his undeserved favor, by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, apart from our own goodness, apart from our own good works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us that. But sometimes even those who know and believe that truth personally, they don't live it out in terms of practical application I mean, for example, we might think of, uh, you know, uh, that God could save a a notorious sinner, somebody that we know is without a doubt lost. And so we we know that God can save them, but but they first need to kind of clean up their lives a little bit. Folks, if we believe that, that's to say that we deny God's free grace. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. Jesus Christ died for you. You Now, Peter, the apostle Peter and the other apostles, they knew that salvation was by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and not by our good works, not by our own efforts. But practically speaking, they also believed that to be right with God, a pagan Gentile had to become a Jew in the sense of obeying the Jewish laws regarding circumcision and the ceremonial uh, issues. You know, in, in, in Peter's day, the evangelistic message might have been something like this. Find God, become a Jew. Because they wanted you to, to become a Jew in order to be right with God. And I think this is huge because In chapter 10 of the book of Acts, if you have your scripture and we'll open up to that, we're going to be camping out there for just a little while this morning. But but in chapter 10 of Acts, we read about a fellow by the name of Cornelius. He was a Roman centurion of the Italian cohort, which means he was doubly Roman, okay? 
He was from Rome, but he was also serving Rome as a centurion. But it says there in Acts chapter 10, verse 1, that he was a God-fearing man, that he worshiped the one true God. And I think this is huge because he worshiped the one true God. This was a Gentile who was worshiping God. It says that he was a good man, that he gave alms to the Jews, that, that even for being a Roman centurion occupying their territory, he took care of the Jewish people around him. He had a good reputation among the Jews because he was a good man. Now this story in the book of Acts, it was a radical turning point in God's economy of salvation. For almost 2,000 years since Abraham, okay, going all the way back to Abraham, salvation was from the Jews and it was through the Jews. And God had promised Abraham that through his descendants, all the nations of the world would be blessed. But up until now, the blessing of salvation was pretty much bottled up with the Jews. But notice a radical shift that takes place today in this passage. See, the door of salvation swings wide open. It swings wide open to the Gentiles and it does not require them to first become Jews in order to be right with God. This is big stuff. This is a huge announcement. And the wonderful truth is that everyone who puts their trust in Jesus Christ receives salvation. Everyone who puts their trust in Jesus Christ receives salvation. Let's read. I want to, I want to pick up this story real quick. Um, and just recap a little bit of it. Beginning in chapter 10 and the first part, you have Cornelius who sees a vision of an angel of the Lord. And it says, you need to send to Joppa. You need to send a contingent of people over to Joppa and See if you can get Peter, the apostle Peter, to come back and tell you what I've commanded him. And so he sees this vision, so he dispatches uh, three people uh, to go fetch Peter from Joppa. He's living in Caesarea, about 30, 35 miles away. So he, he sends them out. Well, the next day they arrive there, and, and what happens is they're standing at the gate, and Peter's getting ready for lunch. He's had quite a long morning, and so he kind of falls into this trance. Maybe he was daydreaming. Maybe he fell asleep. But he saw in this trance, he saw this big, huge sheet coming out of heaven. And as it came down out of heaven, on it were all kinds of living things, things with four legs, you know, things that you would eat, all kinds of stuff. And he said, Lord, no, I can't do that because I've never eaten anything that was unclean being a good Jew, right? And, and, and the Lord says, no, Peter, arise, kill, and eat. And, and, and Peter's kind of questioning that, and he's like, no, and it, it happens again. And it happens a third time. Well, then there's a knock at the door. Guess who's at the door? Cornelius' men. And so basically God was preparing Peter in that. So Peter goes with them back to Caesarea, so that, that, that he can explain to Cornelius what God has commanded him. And so they go back without, without reservations. He, Peter goes with them. And it, it's interesting because Cornelius is there when he gets there. And Cornelius bows down and says, begins to worship. And Peter says, get up, I'm just a man. But he said, and this is where it says at the end of... Uh, Verse 33 says, Cornelius said, so I sent for you immediately and you have, you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. And what follows is Peter's sermon to Cornelius and all of his household. And so verse 34, chapter 10 says, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. 
Verse 38, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are, his, we are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. That's quite a testimony. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. Loving Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us in this place. And I ask, Father, that you would pour your spirit out upon your people in these last days. Father, that you would do something that only you could do. And Father, we're gonna be very careful to give you the the glory and the honor for what you do. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, I love this passage. Because we have Peter's sermon here, and out of that sermon, I, I want to give you five things that you can, that you can just look at and write down and, and, and camp on. And the first one is this, is that salvation is not based on national identity or on our good works. That salvation from the Lord is not based on who you are and where you're from. You know, it seemed like Peter <laughs> learned best in the series of threes. You remember uh, there was three times the, the rooster crowed? You remember three times he denied Christ? You remember three times Jesus said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Now here we also have the sheet coming down three times. And then there's three people at the door. I mean, it seems like Peter learns best three times. He doesn't learn as quick as some of us, but you know, we love Peter. And uh, some of us probably need that third time, you know, just to kind of confirm things. But he begins his sermon here by opening his mouth and saying, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. I mean, what a statement. This coming from a Jew, this coming from Peter who when he, when he first met Cornelius, he said, it's not right uh, that a Jew would come and, and be with a foreigner, not only talking to them, but actually going into his house. And, and he makes that statement uh, in, in earlier in this chapter. But Peter is saying that God does not show favor to anyone based on their nationality. But that's not always been the case. As I was talking about earlier, that... God's impartiality that we, that we see in the Old Testament, uh, in Deuteronomy 10, it was decidedly in a Jewish context. And when we read about that in Deuteronomy 10, you know, Moses had point, pointed out that God had chosen the Jews. He had chosen this people above all other peoples on the earth. And in that context, he, he used God's impartiality to encourage Israel Um, not to accept bribes, um, to show justice to everyone, even to treat foreigners with, by supplying them with the basic needs that they have. Because he wanted them to be different from the other nations of the world. See, but the Old Testament clearly shows God's favoritism for the Jews above the other nations, at least during this time period from Abraham to Christ. So you can see how difficult it would be for any Jew to pivot their thinking on this. 
The vision that Peter had must have been something because it spoke to the very core of his being. But see, understand, God is doing something new here. God is wanting to do something new and through his vision of the sheep being let down from heaven, um, Peter came to this radical conclusion that God is not partial to anyone based on their nationality. That God is for all people, all his creation. And this insight would literally change the history of the world. You and I today are believers in Jesus Christ because of what happened in Cornelius' home. This is pivotal in, in all of history. And the application for us is that people from every racial and national background are on equal footing when it comes to receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. That we all need repentance, that we all need to be saved for all eternity. We're all on even footing there. They don't have to become Americanized, praise God, in order to become a Christian. See, the second part of Peter's statement needs to be interpreted in context of this chapter. Cornelius was a God-fearing man who did many good deeds. But we need to understand that although Cornelius was a good man, his goodness had not saved him. His goodness had not saved him, even though he had given lots of alms, even though he had been a God-fearing man, even though he worshiped the one true God, his good deeds had not saved him. <laughs> he still needed someone to explain the way of salvation to him, and that's exactly what Peter did. He still needed to receive the forgiveness of his sins. And the whole point of this story, the whole point of this narrative is to show how this man came to salvation in Jesus Christ. God was orchestrating the events. God was drawing him. And listen, whenever a person is seeking after God, it is because God is at work drawing that person to himself. We don't seek him on our own. He is drawing us. See, Cornelius did not yet understand salvation, but his fear of God and his good deeds was drawing him toward that point. And even before Peter's sermon is over, <laughs> Peter was just getting warmed up. Even before his sermon was over, the Holy Spirit fell on that place and Cornelius received salvation. See, understand this, that God works differently with different people. He works differently with different people. He saves some people right up out of that slimy pit of sin. They, they don't even know God. They're wallowing in it and they're not seeking after God and he dramatically enters their lives and he rescues them out of that slimy pit of sin. And at any moment, they may turn from their sins to follow Christ, but with others like Cornelius, he put it on his heart to draw near to him. He, he puts the hunger in their hearts to know him and they begin to seek him and they try to please him with their lives. But they're still sinners and they don't receive salvation until they hear the gospel and they put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. See, here's a great lesson for us to be learned from Cornelius. If you desire to know God, if you desire to know God and to have your sins forgiven, then you're more likely to, excuse me, to succeed in that if you are reading God's word and if you are listening to the preaching of God's word, if you are going to church rather than hanging out at a local bar. See, God has a means of reaching people. God uses certain means to save people. If people keep on in their sinful ways, they're not gonna use the means that God has given them. See, by reading God's word, by listening to the preaching of his word, you know what 1 Corinthians 1, 21 says? It says, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached. 
In other words, through the foolishness of preaching to save those who will believe. It's God's plan. In the word, listening to the word being preached, the one who is seeking God will find God, even as Cornelius did. Now, the result of that is eternal life. Eternal life, being saved for all eternity. Secondly, I would say this. Salvation centers on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I mean, in his sermon, you, you look at this, and, and the, one of the first things that Peter says is God took the initiative in sending the gospel. I mean, if you look at this, um, verse 36, he says, the word which he, which God sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He sent word to the sons of Israel, preaching peace peace through Jesus Christ. I mean, as human beings, we come up with all kinds of ways to appease God or to approach God, but they all fall short. Only God, only God could send the gospel to reach people. He's the one who initiates it. He initiates the way of peace by sending his son who would carry our sins And the fact that Jesus preached peace, it implies that there is hostility between sinful humans and a holy God. See, while many folks admit that they aren't perfect, some see themselves as basically good. They compare themselves with other people criminals or other evil people and they conclude that God will let them into heaven sometime, someday because they're not as bad as this person. See, the word of God says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I mean, why did he have to say all? Because there's none righteous, no, not one. James chapter two, verse 10 says this. It says, if we have broken only one of God's holy commandments, then we are guilty of breaking the whole law. See, those who think they are righteous enough to enter God's holy presence are guilty of pride of the worst sort. Recognize that God is for the humble. So just kind of make this note in your mind. Humility Good, pride, bad. God's against pride, especially the kind of pride that that, that we think we know better than God. When we reject his son, we think we know better than God. See, there's hostility between us and God, even if we don't realize it. And Jesus Christ is the only mediator of that peace. But notice that Peter states plainly that Jesus is Lord of all, (laughs) meaning not only Lord of the Jews, but also of the Gentiles. And Peter emphasized the fact that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. You know, the word Christ or Messiah means holy one, anointed one. In his humanity, Jesus showed us how we as humans should live in dependence upon God, doing good for others and overcoming Satan's oppression. This also shows that the battle that rages between God and the enemy. See, to preach the gospel, to be a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to engage the enemy in combat. Jesus' death on the cross was God's mean of making peace between himself and sinners. And Jesus paid that debt that we deserve. God took our sin and laid it on his son Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, and he had no sin of his own. He carries our sin. But had Jesus died and remained in the grave, his death would not have been enough, but God raised him 
on the third day, and he validated his resurrection by allowing him to appear and made him visible to many witnesses. And Peter mentions that they ate and they drank uh, with him to show the reality of Jesus' physical resurrection. It wasn't just a spiritual resurrection. He was there in the, in the flesh in a glorified body. And Peter is a witness to that. He saw that. This risen Lord is the one whom God appointed to be judge over everyone. I mean, unless you miss this, verse 42 says, he appointed, excuse me, he ordered us to preach to the people, the solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and dead. I want to pull over and park here for just a moment. Peter's sermon offers some application for us. And if you are a witness for Jesus Christ, if you testify to what Jesus Christ has done for you, you need to, you need to understand this. People need to understand the basic facts about the life and ministry of Jesus before they can make an intelligent decision to repent and believe in him. Most often we think we're good enough, but we're not. We need to recognize that we are a sinner. If we don't recognize that we are a sinner, we will never turn away from our sins. See, people may need to start by reading the gospels and to gain enough information in order to respond to Christ. They need to know what he did for them. And secondly, I would say as a witness, we need to stay focused on the person and work of Christ when we talk to people about spiritual things. We can talk about a lot of things. We could talk about evolution. We could talk about predestination. We could talk about the end times. But what I'm saying as as a testimony uh, and, and a witness for Jesus Christ, we need to focus on what Jesus Christ did for us. Keep bringing the conversation back to who Jesus is and what he did on the cross. I would say also we have not adequately proclaimed the gospel if we leave out the lordship of Jesus Christ. They need to understand him that he is going to be the judge on that day when we stand before almighty God. And either you're going to be covered in his blood or you're going to stand guilty on your own. And that's the choices that you have. Unless people realize and understand that they have been in rebellion against a rightful Lord of the universe, they will never turn and repent. They will will stand guilty before him someday. But they don't have a reason to repent unless they understand that they are in rebellion against God. So we have to let them know that. We have to point out the lordship of Jesus and the fact of the coming judgment. Now, moving on, I would say also that salvation spreads to others through our faithful witness. Oh, we need to give a witness. We need to, we need to be the salt and light. And, and Peter repeatedly emphasizes this point. He says, we are witnesses of all the things that he did. I mean, he's preaching to Cornelius, who is a good man, who has done lots of good things on his own. And he's preaching there and and he says, we are witnesses, verse 39, of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. I mean, they were witnesses of the things that he did. They were witnesses to the resurrection. Um, He ordered them to preach to the people and to bear witness as the one who to believe in for the forgiveness of sins. And the point is for us that since God has saved us from our sins, he has also appointed us as witnesses to others. If you've received salvation, then you need to tell others what the Lord has done for you. See, God's method was not to proclaim the gospel through the angels in heaven. His, to shout it from heaven, his method is to use his people to share the gospel with other people. I would say also that salvation comes to everyone who believes in the name of Jesus Christ. Salvation comes to everyone who believes in the name of Jesus Christ. See, the name of Jesus refers to all he is and all that he has done. And even though Cornelius was a good man, even though he still needed to hear about Jesus Christ and put his faith and trust in him, Peter proclaimed back in Acts chapter four, verse 12, he said, there is 
There is salvation in no one else, for the, there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. If you don't hear anything else I say today, listen to this. There is no salvation apart from faith in Jesus Christ. No other name, no other religion, no other faith. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. See, there is salvation, though, for everyone who believes in him. It's not a general, vague sort of belief. Rather, it's specific and very personal. To believe in the name of Jesus means that in humility, I no longer rely upon myself or my own merit as I stand before a a holy God. I trust only in what Jesus did on the cross as my hope for the forgiveness of my sins and for eternal life. See, as our worship team begins to come back up here and and, and lead us as we wrap this up, I just want you to focus in with me on this last point. Salvation brings obvious evidence in everyone who receives it. Once you receive salvation, you cannot hide it. It it, it comes and it, it brings obvious evidence. See, Peter didn't even get to finish his sermon before everyone responded. In fact, In recounting it, he said, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell. The Holy Spirit fell and it it filled them. And it was just, he was just warming up and, and, and God intervened and everyone there got saved. Everyone there was brought to salvation. Now I must say that's never happened in my preaching where I, I got to, I didn't get to finish when the Holy Spirit took over, but he's welcome if he wants to. But I I understand that as he did, everyone received the Holy Spirit there. They received the Holy Spirit. And and ever since Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside the believer at salvation. When we confess him as our Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us at salvation. And as a believer learns to walk in the Spirit over time, the deeds of the flesh will diminish And the fruit of the Spirit will increase, making the Spirit's presence more evident. Notice in this passage, it says that they they spoke in unlearned foreign languages. They spoke in tongues. This was a unique situation, this gift of speaking translatable foreign languages that the speaker had not studied. In other words, they were just instantly able to speak in Greek or another language or, or French or Spanish. They, they, they hadn't studied it and they hadn't learned it, but God gave them that ability and God gave this sign to the Gentiles so that the Jewish Christians would realize that they had the same thing that happened to them back at Pentecost. All of a sudden, they're like, whoa, whoa. The same thing happened to us. You remember at Pentecost? They were also baptized, it says. Now, water baptism is the outward profession of what God has already done inwardly and spiritually. And it always in the New Testament follows salvation. Everyone who has believed in Christ as Savior and Lord should obey him and be baptized in water. It also says that they desired to know more and to grow in their faith. They asked Peter at the very end of this chapter to stay on for a few days. They wanted to learn more about this gift of salvation. They wanted to know more about Jesus. They wanted to know more about that. You know, a wiser and older Peter said in his letters, 2 Peter 3, 18 says, everyone who is truly saved will desire to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, even good religious people need the forgiveness of their sins. Because on that day, he will either be your judge or your savior. And he offers salvation to everyone who will believe in him. So I ask the question, what about you today? What about you today? Are you religious? 
I mean, most people are religious in some way or another. But as we can see from the record of Cornelius, a person can be religious and still be lost. So the question is, have you repented of your sins and received Christ as your Savior and Lord? I'm not talking about being a church member. I'm not talking about doing good, doing good deeds, doing good works. I'm talking about having a relationship with Jesus Christ where you humbled yourself, confessed your sin, and received him into your heart. Because that's what it says happens when salvation occurs. That we're walking in a certain way, we recognize that that we need to change, we come before the Lord, we turn from our sin, we move in the opposite direction. We repent of those sins and we move in the opposite direction and we are forever changed by the forgiveness of our sins. See, if you've never done that, with all of my heart, I want to encourage you to do that this morning. God exalts the humble. Would you pray with me? Loving Father, I thank you for this time and I thank you for this this passage, this word out of your scripture. And Father, I ask that you would just quicken our hearts, that your Holy Spirit would just reign in our hearts. And Father, that you would do what only you could do. That you would draw us to you. That even in this moment, even in this moment, this time of response, Father, that you would be exalted. Lord Jesus, that you would come into full focus. And God, that we would recognize that our goodness is like filthy rags compared to your holiness. And God, that we would desire more of you and less of us. Father, that our commitment to you and to be your witnesses would would deepen our testimony, that we would desire that others come to know you in a very personal way. Father, I pray that you would break our heart for those who don't know you. Father, that you would show us that it's more, it's not about us. But Father, you must increase and we must decrease. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would have his way in each of our hearts. In these moments that remain. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.